Greetings, my name is Michael Rikalma, Chief of the Qualcomm First Nation. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the fact that I'm standing on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Sabretooth, and Squamish First Nation. I do have ties to the Musqueam First Nation through my mother, Margaret Rikalma. Welcome to this special episode of Kitty Plugged In. Two years ago, we brought you the story of Chief Rikalma and his journey with kidney disease. In our last interview, the Chief opened up about his challenges after his diagnosis in 2018. While I was in St. Paul's, the one thing that still makes people wonder, I lost my vision. I went blind. And his experiences on dialysis. It was told to me by a nurse. She said, think about your kidneys, Michael all day, all night, what, you, what they do for you. And she goes, what we're doing to you in four hours, your kidneys do all day and all night. Because I was, I would come out of there exhausted. I was just beat. But that was why, I couldn't understand it, why I felt like this, like, why am I so, I'm just lying here in a bed for four hours. Why am I so tired and why am I just so, exhausted because that's when she said it's four hours of kidney work cleaning your blood all the while though he kept his sense of humor and was always willing to share some words of wisdom eagle feathers are very are very powerful to us eagles are very powerful but cleaning your blood a particular feather was presented to me by the now mayor of Qualicum beach previously he also talked about being on the transplant wait list and how he was actively searching for a kidney donor. Today, we are sitting down with the chief again and his wife, Sharon, his chief caregiver and co-pilot on his kidney journey, as they have an update on his story. Kalma, you look fantastic. How are you feeling? I'm feeling like I'm 50 years old again. It, it's just amazing. The transformation was, I, I can't explain it, how the energy level went up, how much better I feel. You know, the appetite's better. The weight gain is great, almost too great. But I mean, it, it's, it's the feeling of the energy boost that, that really, I guess, surprised me how, how fast that happened and just, there's only way I could put it. The, the, the way that the, the transformation that happened so quickly thereafter. That's amazing. It's like going back, like you said, going back 10 years. So there's so much we can do now. There's, you know, there's so many things. We can look forward to doing stuff. We can go and visit our son without having to go, what day is dialysis? If we leave this time, we can be in, you know, be down there and, and at this time, and we have to race back for dialysis at this time. And, you know, not having to do that is, is just, it's so different. I want to go back to the day that you received the call. Can you talk a bit about how you were feeling? On that day, I was in the office at eight o'clock and it was 8.15, I got the call. I was outside with some of the workers and I recognized the number at St. Paul's. So I just said to her, I've got to get to a quieter room. And I went into the boardroom and she proceeded to tell me that my transplant date is set. I have a living donor. It's set for February 28th. And I'm to be in Vancouver on February the 24th. I sat there stunned. Didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. So there was a young lady in the office with me so I, I'm sitting there with the phone in my, my phone in my hand. And I, I said to Trilena, I said, could you please phone my wife? I, I, I need her to come down here. So she came back later and she goes, she's not answering. So I just said, well, I'll just, I'll just go home. And then so away I went. And so I, 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 go, in, I go into the, Sharon was in the bedroom at that point in time. And then so I just, just blurted out, I got the call. And what do you say after that? It's look in her face and mine, I bet, were just, just um, shock still. 
still shock the fact that, you know, it's happening. It's going to happen February the 28th. I, it, was, it was stunned silence. I think it's the first time I was ever quiet. <laughs> it was just there was, I was speechless. There was no words, you know. You just wanted to shout hooray and, and jump up and down. And, and I think actually maybe we even did at one point because it, it's just there's no words to explain when you get that call. You know, you're waiting for it, you're waiting for it. And sometimes you think it might not happen too soon. And then there it is, you know, there's that call. And then you start thinking about, things you have to do, I have to do, we have to do to prepare for, for departure on February the 24th. There's not a lot of time, but you know, we've got to just get things going. Of course, the packing, what do you take with us? You're going to be gone for two months and it's still winter. It was really cold and wintry and making sure all your paperwork, your representation agreement, your wills, all of that needed to be updated and, and ready to go. Thank goodness the lawyer was, when I phoned the lawyer and said, okay, we don't have six weeks, we have six days now, it's gotta be done. He, he got on it right away for us. And um, just making sure we had, a, even accommodation, getting, making sure that that was set up and transportation over from the island. There's all these little things that you don't think about until you're hit with, how do we get over to Vancouver? Are we flying, are we driving, are we bringing the car? You know, if we bring the car, then parking is how much a day and all these other little things that go on. It's, it's, it's going to happen. take you back a bit now. Can you just talk a little bit about how you found out who your donor was? I just left people to their own avails. If they so choose, chose to, to try to um, be a match, of course, the first step was always get your blood checked to see what type you are. And, you know, some people just, of course, they, weren't, they didn't know their blood type. And the same thing, I agree with that, because had somebody asked me, four or five years ago, which blood type, I would have said red. <laughs> I didn't know, it didn't matter. But you know, now I know. And so as, as time went on, people would tell me they were going to try. And well, you know, either they were wrong blood type or for whatever reason, they didn't make it. Um, they washed up somewhere along the line. But when it came time for the call, I knew there was two people very close to the end of that journey to to become a, a donor. It was um, Scott and a lady. So I didn't know which one it was because the lady from St. Paul said, it's up to the donor to contact you or not. So I didn't know. Scott didn't phone us for a few days. And he said, he said oh, by the way, it's me. So we had communicated over time about how he was doing in the process until someone knew he was close to the end to find out that he would be a viable match. Can you talk about what that call was like when you talked to Scott? That feels like, again, you're humbled by it. And I, I tell people, I've said it many, many times, it's a gift of life and it's a gift for life. He's my forever friend now. He always, we're political friends anyway but it just changed the whole concept of our relationship. When he decided just to say, okay, I'm, I'm a no positive and I can, I can donate to you. So he feels like family. Does, he became family. We share an organ now. <laughs> well, actually he shares it, not me. So you were describing a very special ceremony that took place earlier. We're gonna call it the, the, uh, the airport event. Can you talk a little bit about that? The community knew the departure date and the time. So there was people invited to the send-off, shall we say, uh, that I had invited and Scott had invited, and it turned out to be a very large send-off. My nephrologist was there, and Sharon, obviously, but um, also my social worker. People that were, you know, helped me through my journey. I mean, the nephrologist saved my life in the beginning. 
And then I said at the, at the ceremony that the social worker saved my head. But what the community did was the council members wrapped us in blankets. They called it to blanket us. And then there was a song sang for us to send us off in a good way. Because, but the blanketing is so the ancestors would look after us through our journey. The song was from Squamish. Uh, my nephew sang it. And, um, but there was the blanket and a feather. I was given a, we were each given a, a eagle feather, beaded eagle feather from each one of the council members because eagles are a sign of strength, correct? So it was, it, it was, it was the whole ceremony was done um, in a circle. And again, the circle just signifies there, there's nobody, nobody's in front, nobody's behind. We all face in. And um, when, when the work is done, that's what we call it, um, we just, we just accepted all of the, the gratitude from the community members. I, I think I had tears running down my, my eyes because you don't realize how blessed you are with friends until something like that happens. And you know, the people that did, I knew that there was going to be more people there than Michael knew because I'd heard that there was going to be some extra people there. I didn't realize there was going to be as many people there as there were. So it was it was really just to know that you've got that many friends that you can call on for help or support or whatever you need. It's just, it's just a blessing. So I understand that nobody else was on the plane. So, so talk about that. What did that mean? When I booked, because we found out that Scott was going on ISQ Air and he had booked his flight for that day. So I said, Jeremy, we should go on the same flight. So I booked two seats. And then I just happened to see that the young lady that was that took the call was I said, just, just so Tara, Tara knows, I said, this is a kidney flight. I said, Scott Harrison, who was on the flight, well, I know that. That's where we're going. He's the donor, and I am the recipient of his kidney. And Sharon is going to look, look after me in Vancouver. So I was contacted again the next day and I was told that the plane is ours. It's nobody else is gonna go on it. It's your, it's your flight to Vancouver for the three of you. Kidney flight. This was all done for, for um, no exposure to anybody else, for COVID, COVID safety. She, she booked the whole flight. Well, no more bookings that day for that particular flight. And she was more than happy to, to get us there. We got to South Terminal and they had a little shuttle, a shuttle van, and they took us right from South Terminal to our hotel, so hotel downtown. talk about the transplant. First order of business was COVID test to make sure that I was fine. Um, then from there went more blood work. And what they, what I found out they did was mix our blood to find out if there was any, anything would happen in the match. Because of course our blood, our blood will not be mixed. And that was step one. And then it was just a matter of, okay, then you wait for the results and you go back to your hotel room and wait. And it just, again, you know, this is another nerve-wracking procedure that has got to be done. I understand you had two wishes. Can you talk about those two, two wishes? About a year ago, I got a call from the nephrologist, transplant nephrologist, and he said, Michael, if you got a wish, what would it be? So I sat there for a second, and I went, I'm going to be greedy. I want two wishes. Okay, what are they? I said, I want a kidney and I want it transplanted the day, the, the same day, the day I failed. And I got them both within two weeks. How do we explain that? Somebody's looking after me. Creator. What else is happening leading up to the transplant? Were you scared? No, no, anxious. There's a difference. I'm not sure what's, well, I know what's gonna happen, I don't know how it's gonna happen. I know the day is gonna happen. Uh, I found out the time I'm to be in the hospital. And we also found out that Scott's to be there hours before me. 
because of course they get say, first step is take his kidney out. And then there's no sense having me there opened with the kidney not even come out yet. So you just kind of bide your time and, and just, you know, we, what we did was we um, hung out with Scott and his sister and then our son came over and, and then I went for my last dialysis on the Sunday before transplant, which was oh, the last one, the last one. And, and that was nice to know that I walked out of that dialysis clinic going, um, I'm not coming back. It, it saved my life, you know, over and over and over again, but we're done. I'm, I'm, it's time to turn the page on that chapter. We're moving on and it's going to start tomorrow. And what about you, Sharon? How are you feeling? Anxious. Anxious that something would call it off at the last minute. Because until it's done, it's not, you know, there's always the chance that something could happen that it's not going to get done. So I think for me, that was the big thing was just the waiting and the anxiousness of, of having it happen. And because of COVID, the, our son couldn't come into the hospital and sit with us. And, and there was, you know, there was the, the little things that are a little bit different because of COVID. So, yeah, and that made it a little bit more anxious too, as well. You're being rolled into surgery. The emotions must be high. What what's going through your your head as that's happening? I I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a nap, but I'm guessing it was about five or six hours, and I remember them waking me up. I think it was about eleven o'clock at night, and they they. To, to whoever, I don't know if it was a doctor who it was, but I'm all groggy. And he said, I have your wife on the phone here. So would you want to talk to her? I said, well, I have to. <laughs> and so I started talking because he, he had said, we're taking him up, back up to his room soon. So we chatted. I don't know what I said. Couldn't, couldn't tell you. And um, so then it was up to my room I went. And I, you know, again, just fell back asleep again. And I was like, where am I now? <laughs> because I remember going into the OR, I remember putting the arm board on me, and then all of a sudden, I'm back in my room. I don't know, they, they, they got me. How are you feeling? Tired, tired, and a little bit sore. I did, not even sore, uncomfortable, because I'm going, oh, bandages, you know, just zip strips. It's over, it's done. You know, now, now there's, now there's no turning back on, on, like I said, now the page is turned. Now we're, now we're, cha we're changing our life path again for, I don't know, the better was still, the dialysis was still better than dying, but now we're changing the path again to no, a life without dialysis. So how long before you got to see Scott uh, after your transplant surgery? I think it was, it was three, it was about three days. Three days. He was yeah. next door, but he just, kept to himself and that's what he wanted. So what was that first meeting like between you and Scott? <laughs> the first meeting was, um, we did, we just kind of looked at each other. And, and so I, I seem to remember just saying, thank you. And uh, he says, I'd have done it anyway. He, he, he said more than once, he goes, I have a great deal of respect for you. And he goes, that, that's why I did it. I've always had an admiration for the work you do and you, just as a person. Once he started doing his journey through the transplant process, he goes, I'm not turning back until something happens or not. So right now, so your your world has opened up a little bit, things that you couldn't eat before you now can eat. Uh, what are some of the favorite things that are now back on the menu for you? That I could eat? <laughs> Bananas, <laughs> um, tomatoes. So in other words, I can have pizza because it's tomato sauce. And we did that. We went down to a pizzeria and got a pizza made. It was delicious. After four years, nice. I missed it. What else has changed in life? Energy level. I'm supposed to walk for three to four K a day. And on a normal day, I'll do maybe 
five or six, and on a really good day, I'll do up to 10 or 12. And the doctor went, what? And I went, 12K, you know, just walk around town. So, but that, that's nice to have that much of energy. And I always remember that we talk about energy. I remember my last day of dialysis, we're walking back and I had to stop probably halfway up and <laughs> lean on a building to have a break. And then I had to get my Francis, my son, to, I said, hey, you better take my arm and kind of pull start me here. You know, one of my goals was to not use that little elevator to walk up those eight stairs. And as time went on, I did it. You know, and then now I just don't, I just, yeah, do away I go. But again, these little, these little goals that I made for myself were just, were just, um, I had to do it. I wanted to do it. Meal planning is much easier, much, much easier. Um, the first couple of weeks after surgery, uh, he had to eat nine ounces of protein a day. So that was a bit challenging and red meat was out still. But once he got over that hump, then, you know, we had, we found a butcher in Yale town and the, oh, we had grass fed beef <laughs> at $20 a pound and it was so, good and we can eat out a little bit more you know we don't have to sort of take into account which restaurants have what food so we've been you know and we're sort of on vacation here because we're not home it'll change when we get home again too we won't be hitting up the bakery every night <laughs> now speaking of dinners uh, you mentioned just before you went into surgery or I guess the night before you were in surgery you had a special dinner with Scott. Both Scott and Michael were on sort of a almost a liquid diet so we got them their takeout soup and our son and his wife were there and Scott's sister was there so we're all sort of crowned into our, our room having takeout dinners and having a family meal and just having a lot of a, a lot of fun and laughter and and yeah it was, it was a good night. Yeah, you've gone from soup to steak. Soup to steak. <laughs> soup to steak, yes. Yeah. Now, four years into this journey, there have been some tough times along the way. Oh, yes. When we're in, in, in Vancouver for the two months we've been here for, I've got a lot of time to think, think back in time. And I think back to the number of days, evenings that turned into days, that turned into weeks, that turned into months over the four year period that Sharon sat in either in an ER with me or urgent care or sometimes during the height of COVID in the parking lot while I'm in Emerge. And, you know, cause we're, I'm sick, so I, I don't, I'm taking no conscious effort of what's going on as i going, I don't, I'm not well. But when I got time to reflect, I think back to how well did you look after me? Sharon, we've talked about your role as a caregiver and all the support that um, you've given. This has been a journey for you too. It's not a journey that uh, you could take on your own easily. It really isn't. Um, I think you need, you need that support. There's so many other people out there that are in a very similar situation. You both have been so optimistic and hopeful throughout this process. Can you talk about that and any words of inspiration that you might give to others in a similar situation? How did, how did both of you keep your hope and your spirits up during this time? A lot of inner strength, lot of inner strength support, community support from many, many places. But I, I, my biggest thing that I, I relied on and knew the fact that I, I never give up faith, I never give up hope. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And it, it, it was just a matter of time. But I, I would tell somebody going, don't ever give up. I'm thinking that once you give up, you might be, you know, what's left? What's left? And as long as you keep that hope up, 
knowing that that it, it's, you know, people are trying. People are there for you. And again, a support system of, of any kind that you so choose to utilize. You know, mine was everywhere. Well, I just want to say congratulations, and you both are an inspiration. Um, and on behalf of the Kidney Foundation, uh, we wish you both the very best, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's been a, it's been a journey, and like I say, just anybody that's out there, never give up. Never give up. Many people to thank during this, this journey I've been on for the last four years, starting with my wife Sharon, which is that I go to the community health nurse that morning of February 28th, 2018. And I will also thank Debbie Heath for uh, calling the ambulance because my blood pressure was very, very high. I want to thank BC Ambulance Service for getting me to Nanaimo that day, and they took me to more than once to NRGH. I would also like to thank the emergency room staff in. NRGH, the nephrology staff, who all helped to diagnose me at that point in, in time, the renal unit for helping us through PD, and, the, and all of the uh, community dialysis units, starting with NRGH, where I began, and then the Nanaimo community, Port Alberni community, Cumberland community, dial dialysis units, my family, friends and family, for those who tried to see if they could, could help me with a kidney, and for Scott Harrison, who did give me a kidney, um, St. Paul's Hospital for the great care I got here, right through my stay, in here from the pre-transplant, transplant, post-transplant, post to the whole, the whole care I've gotten from them has just been fantastic. Thank you all.